Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to extend my thanks to the community for inviting us for this first half of Shah Ramadan. Inshallah, we'll continue to be here until after the A'mal nights. But in terms of our discussion tonight, is the last night here from uh, this particular pulpit. Uh, and hence, I want to extend my thanks to all those who have participated, uh, all those who have brought this series to life. And that means all of the ones who are sitting with us this evening as well as throughout the last 15 nights. It has been an honor to uh, come over such a, a vibrant, vibrant period within the Islamic year. And uh, I pray that inshallah the words have been of some benefit. Please forgive me if there has been any shortcomings. And inshallah I look forward to meeting the community again and serving as best as I can. Please raise your hands. Let us join each other in da'a. There are many people who are unwell. Many people around the world who are in need. We are aware of two young sisters who are very unwell. They continue to be in difficult situations. Let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their shifa and for all those people around the world whom we know are in need. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amma yujibu al idha da'a wa yakshifu su. أما يجيب المصطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 بفضلك وبرحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين بحق محمد وآله الطاهرين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين ولعل الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد قال إمام الحج عليه السلام اللهم ما عرفتنا من الحق فحملنا وما قسرنا عنه فبلغنا اللهم المن به شعثنا وشعب به صدعنا والتق به فتغنا وكثر به قلتنا وعزز به ذلتنا وأغن به عائلنا واخذ به عن مغرمنا واجبر به فقرنا وسد به خلتنا ويسل به عسرنا وبيذ به وجوهنا وفك به أسرنا وأنجح به طالبتنا وأنجز به مواعيدنا واستجب به دعوتنا وأعطنا به سؤلنا وبلغنا به من الدنيا والآخرة آمالنا صلوات Master of our age, Imam Zamana, my respected teachers, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum Jamia wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Our discussions over these last 40 nights have taken us across the length and the breadth of du'a iftitah given to us by the master of our age, Imam al Hajjah Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. Allah. 
We have stated that the du'a is split into two. The first half is a praise towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the second is a praise towards the divine leaders and therefore seeks to build upon our relationship with both. We stated on a previous night that the purpose of the fast, the purpose of this month in particular, is for us to realize the weaknesses that we have and overcome them. The verse in the Holy Quran states to us, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as-siyam, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. The reason why we have prescribed fasting upon you, just as we prescribe fasting upon those before you, is so that you may reach, attain that status of taqwa, God consciousness, discipline within the human soul. Hence the fast, and the fast thus within the month of Ramadan, is for that purpose to absolve ourselves from those weaknesses, so that we obtain that station within ourselves, until next year we can continue to build and build and build for the rest of our lives. We stated that within Shah Ramadan, it is the best of months throughout the entire year. We have seen a pattern that within Rajab, we recite a particular du'a. Within Sha'ban, we recite a particular du'a. And in Shah Ramadan, again, there is a daily du'a to be recited. And if Shah Ramadan is the peak of the months, then it must have the very best of du'as in order to give us that taqwa that we are thereby seeking. There must be that ramp up within the du'a. Rajab, Sha'ban, Shah Ramadan. Hence, du'a iftita should be considered the very best of du'a because it is the very best of months. And here this du'a has been given to us by the master of our age. And we posed the question at the beginning and we said that when we interpret these verses, we are required to interpret them in line with the Imam that has given them to us. Why didn't the commander of the faithful give to us du'a iftitah? Why didn't Imam Baqir or Imam al-Hadi, peace be upon them all, give us the du'a of iftitah? What is it in regards to the Imam of our time? And we continued by asking that if the Imam is the one who is synonymous with ghaybah, we see that the Imam has spent so much time away from our eyes that this du'a must also be relative to the Imam's own life and the relativity of his own period. Hence we ask these sorts of questions and we begin to see that the du'a takes shape in the minds when we ask these questions. Here we state that the Imam who is giving us this du'a is providing us with a very specific manual. If Shah Ramadan is for the purpose for us to reach taqwa. And if the du'a of Shah Ramadan is the best of du'a, and this du'a is linked towards the Imam who gives it to us, when we look at this du'a holistically, we can see that this du'a is specific towards the Imam and the building of our goals for Shah Ramadan. If my goal in Shah Ramadan is to seek out my weaknesses, and move me towards that pinnacle of the human being that I can become, this du'a is also specific towards the month and towards those certain objectives. Thus we find that the Imam in the second half of the du'a is speaking so much about himself, so much about ghaybah, so much about the issues that we need to be aware of in our specific time. That being the case, we can specify that there is clearly a relationship between the concept of ghaybah and the concept of Shah Ramadan. As in, if Shah Ramadan is this month which we are seeking to build ourselves, so we may obtain that highest level of taqwa, the concept of ghaybah is directly associated. There is a relationship between the two. Meaning that the Shah Ramadan, the month of fasting, the purity I am seeking to obtain, the purpose of this obtaining is in order for me to understand ghaybah and for me to bring about an end to ghaybah as quickly as I am capable of doing. There is a direct relationship between my own purity and this unseen imam of mine that is due to return. Here the end of the du'a. Here the end of the du'a that we have recited now in the Arabic khutbah begins to really shed light upon these issues. 
it really begins to delve into the concepts of our period within Ghaybah and what we can be doing to build upon this coming. In these last few nights, we have spoken about some very delicate issues and we have gone into some philosophical depth. We have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to broaden our minds as to why Ghaybah is, as to our understanding as a global community, to understand ourselves as a Muslim nation, to understand our role as a Shia group, to understand ourselves as individuals towards this particular issue of Ghaybah. We have stated that the Ghaybah of the Imam, we must understand it as a universal phenomenon. The Imam is a universal Imam, he is for everyone. We must understand that when he comes, he will be bridging that gap for everyone in humanity. We must understand that although we are the ones calling out for him, there are others who are also in need of this Imam. Though they may not call upon him in the same way we have been calling, their actions, their purity is also a call for the Imam. When we find people around the world who are actioning on behalf of the Imam's own ideals, on behalf of the Imam's own actions and thought processes, their call towards the Imam is purer than my own call towards the Imam at times because they are demonstrating that they are the ones in action whereas my call comes from the tongue, it is only passive. Their call for the Imam is manifesting itself in an action-based manner. We have stated that when it comes to the call of the Imam, we must export this concept of Mahdism. We want the whole world to be calling him. And here we need to build upon this concept. Tonight, inshallah, is our conclusion. We need to bring these concepts to the fore of our thought. And we need to ask ourselves about how to finalize this thought process, this molding of these ideas. So that as we depart this particular series, we leave ourselves with one or two key particular lessons that we can take towards the dhuhr of the Imam of our time. The du'a at hand, du'a iftitah, it has clearly shown us a direction that we need to go. It shows us that in Shah Ramadan, we are constantly thinking about the ghaybah of our Imam. It is molding us that in this time when we are trying to become the perfect human, when we are trying to become the perfect servant of this Imam, what needs to come at the foremost of our thinking is the ghaybah. There is a tradition that comes to us from the commander of the faithful. He says, Adda'a mukh al mu'min. Adda'a mukh al mu'min. The da'a is the source, it is the brain for the mu'min. Meaning that when the Imam begins to discuss these issues of ghaybah, when he begins to discuss these issues of the growth concepts of ghaybah, when he describes the shortcomings that we have within this period of occultation, it is supposed to become the source of our thinking. We are supposed to mold ourselves around his own manual of thoughts. The section of the du'a that we have recited, Allahumma ma arraftana min al haqq fahammilna, wa ma qasuna anhu faballighna. Allahumma al munbihi sha'thana wa sha'abbihi sad'ana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being asked here for something very important. He says, my Lord, oh Allah, help us to bear the weight of this truth. Allahumma ma'arraftana min al-haqq fahammilna. Allow us to know, have ma'rifa, bear the burden, the weight of this truth that is bearing upon us. You know, as a believer of the Imam, there is a huge responsibility. An Imam is actually asking for this. Help us to bear the burden of this. Allahumma ma'arraftana min al-haqq fahammilna. Wa ma qasuna anhu faballighna. Do not allow us to fall short in the conveyance, the deliverance of these responsibilities. Look at the statement being made by the Imam on behalf of his Shia. What is being conveyed to us? The relativity of these words. He continues, Allahumma ma'arraftana min al-haqq fahammilna, wa ma qasuna anhu faballighna, Allahumma al-munbihi sha'thana, wa sh'abbihi sad'ana, wa tuqbihi fatqana. He is saying now in this section of the du'a, Oh Allah, 
We are separated. Help us to come together. Bring together us in unity. Help us to repay our debts. Help us to realize our shortcomings and overcome them. Help us in these manners so that we can become better as we are supposed to be. In this section of the du'a, there are secrets that are being mentioned by the Imam. If I want to know the period in which I am living in, if I want to know why there is no dhuhr tomorrow and Friday, why there has not been a dhuhr until to date, I need to look at these lines of the du'a and assess my actions, my actions within the community and our actions as a Shia nation, our actions as a Muslim nation, and most importantly, our actions as a human body. And thus we will be able to understand why the dhuhr has not taken place yet. Oh Allah, it's very simple. Bring us together in unity. What is the Imam saying? We are not united. Hence, if we are to bring forth the dhuhr, we need to become united. We need to be together. He says this, bring, to us, bring us together, stitch us together in this united nation. Oh my Lord, if we are poor, help us to repay back our debts. The responsibilities of us in society. He is talking about these issues. Hence, we need to observe these lines of du'a in accordance with the shortcomings that we have and use these as a tick box to understand how we need to grow to become or bring about that culminating factor. When it comes to this issue, let us start thinking now. Let us again put on our thinking caps. In the last seven days, I think we have really challenged the thought processes that we have had. And let us bring this concept to that culmination. Let us ask ourselves a question. Imagine for a minute you were not a Shia. Let us step outside the box for a minute and not come with our bias. Let us not come with the knowledge that we know. Because you and I come with a certain level of knowledge. We have learned, we have gone through madaris, we have been reading books, majlis comes every single week. We come with a certain gradient of thinking. But let us assume this point of the discussion as if I am not a Shia, as if I was a Sunni who didn't believe in the occultation, or as if I was a Christian who does not believe in the presence of a 12th Imam or the Mahdi that I believe in. Let us start with these sorts of questions. I pose you a very simple question. What is the purpose of Ghayba? What is the justice of Ghayba? As in, we are talking about an individual who is the supreme individual of our time. He is the one who is supposed to bring justice just the way that there is injustice. He is the one who is supposed to bring about the culmination of human society. He is the one who can bring us together. He is the one that can bring us from our poverty of thinking to the very peak of what we are supposed to become. He is the grace of the Holy Prophet of Islam in one. He is the knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib in one. He is the patience of Al-Hasan in one. He is the bravery of al Hussein in one. He is the worshipper of Zayn al-Abideen in one. He is the one who will split open knowledge like Baqir in one. He is the one who will bring about the culmination of thought and accept others like Ja'far al-Sadiq in one. He is Bab al-Hawa'ij like Musa al-Kadhim in one. He is the one who is Gharib al-Ghuraba of our day all in one. He is like the pure youth Muhammad Jawad in one. He is like Ali in al-Hadi who began the preparation of Ghayba in one. And he is the one who is the one who is proving to all the Khulafa his grand stature like his father Hassan al-Askari in one. I ask you a very simple question. What is the purpose of Ghayba? What is the justice of Ghayba? Is it just to you? Not as a Shia. If you didn't believe in Al-Mahdi, but you know the height and the grandiosity, and I am explaining to you the grand culmination of this human being in one, and you were a Christian, would you not ask this question? Why would your Lord in your religion take away this human being for 1200 years, maybe 15, maybe 2000 years, 
only to bring him back when so much terror, so much blood has been shed, so much wealth has been wasted, so much life has gone to spoil. Am I not entitled to ask this question? Would you not ask this question? Even if you were not a Christian, would you not ask this question as a Shia? Why has he taken the Imam away from our eyes? What purpose does it serve? When I begin to understand this question correctly, I will then begin to understand my role as a Shia, A, within the religion, and B, within humanity, in order to bring about the culmination of this human prince. The purpose of Ghayba has been only one. The purpose of Ghayba was to take away this human savior from the eyes of humanity in order for them to reach the point of justice on their own. The purpose of the Ghayba was to remove this individual so that we apply what we have been taught we begin to accept Qur'an, we begin to accept what Ahl al-Bayt say, and we are the ones who will want to apply it for ourselves, with or without the human saviour present. I recognise the justice of this Imam, and I want to implement it whether he is present or whether he is not present. I want to reach a state where my thinking is in line with the Imam's thinking, making me as a human body worthy of his coming. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him away from our eyes and said, O humanity, I have given you 124,000 prophets and many wise men. I have given you grand women who are the peaks of humanity for you. I have given you book after book after book. I have given you imam after imam after imam. There is nothing I have not taught you. There is no lesson of ethics or of law or of philosophy or of theology that you do not have present with you. I am now asking you to obtain the purpose that I created for you in the first place. Imam is away. Instead of you seeping into the depths of destruction, wasting money, killing each other at random, blowing each other up, having racism and prejudice within yourselves. I ask you to break those shackles and become what I created you to become in the first place. Obtain your purpose. When you have obtained your purpose and you are ready as a human body to behold the Imam, that is when I will send him back to you and not a moment sooner. It is really that simple. It is like saying, in this community, the president is the all-knowing, he probably claims himself to be the all-knowing. Imagine the president has this ability, and he knows how to govern, and he knows how to make this community tick perfectly. He will run union, he will run madrasa, he will run welfare, he will run this and every single subcommittee. But then he has taught us how to run as well. He has left for us all the aspects, all the tools to do it. And then he goes away. What is his expectation of us? His expectation is that we do not fall into a pit whereby we cannot learn to run the community ourselves. He expects us to take those principles. And he says that if you drop, I will not return until you have learned how to govern yourselves in your community. It is exactly the same thing from our Imam's perspective. I am waiting on the people who call upon me to obtain their purpose. And I am waiting on those people that don't know of me to realize that they need me. And when they realize, that is when I will be sent to return back to you. Now, how do we understand this? How do we qualify and quantify this issue? Let us assume for a minute, let us just say, Imam Ali wasalam, is coming tomorrow on Friday at 12 o'clock. May Allah hasten his reappearance. Let us assume that he is coming tomorrow. What will happen? What will be the sequence of events? The first thing he will do is he will stand by the Holy Kaaba and he will announce his coming. He will say, I am here. Ya ma'shar al-khala'iq. O gathering of everything in creation. 
Al Mahdi is here. Then he will wage war. He will wage war against those people that seek to stop the divine presence of a godly, just government. And those who seek to obtain or seek to oppress or seek to push him away, they will wane by his side. He will be sent away from the Imam. Having established government, how long is the Imam staying in government for? How many years? Seven years. Seven years. Ahsant. The minimum, according to our ahadith, is five years. The maximum is nine years. Think about this very carefully, brothers and sisters. He has been in ghaibah for how many years? 1200 years. He may be in ghaibah for 2000 years. He may be in ghaibah for 5000 years. But when he comes, he is only going to be present in government for a maximum of nine years, no more. What does that tell us? That tells us that in those nine years, he will have established that government around the world. He will have established peace just the way peace is ought to be. He will teach us how to distribute wealth around the world as it ought to be. He will teach us how to become a governing race of human beings. Whether I'm in New Zealand or Mexico or Bolivia or Pakistan, he will teach us how to be as we are ought to be in those nine years. Now here I pose to you a very simple question. He is martyred after nine years. And he leaves us. After those nine years, if we have not learned to become as we are supposed to become, what will happen when he leaves us? He comes, he establishes government. He teaches us how to be. He dies after nine years, martyred. What will happen? If we are not capable of governing ourselves, we will return back to the way we were pre-Mahdi, will we not? We will kill the way we used to kill. We will waste money the way we used to waste money. We will be the ones who oppress the way we used to oppress. The purpose of the Imam is not to teach us. It is for us to have reached the point ourselves merge our thought process with him. He will show us his way of doing. When he is martyred and leaves us, we will learn and be able to govern ourselves because we want to be governed in that manner. If I am not ready to behold the coming of the Imam, when he comes and leaves, I will only go back, I will regress to the way I was before. The purpose of the ghaybah, the reason to remove the Imam from my eyes for such a long period is to allow mankind to reach the peak in which they are supposed to reach independently. They want to act as they should act on their own accord and then I will send my Imam to you. Once I have sent him to you, you will then be able to work alongside his ideals and you will not reject him the way the people rejected Rasulullah. You will not reject him the way the people rejected Ali ibn Abi Talib. You will not reject him the way the people rejected Hassan al-Askari. You will be those group of people in Mexico, in Bolivia, in Alaska, in New Zealand, wherever you may be, that is ready and befitting of a human savior. That is the purpose of ghaybah. That is the reason for the occultation, for us to reach that peak on our own, utilizing the tools Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Let us go further in this thought. Let us challenge, let's break the veils of these thoughts that have encompassed us as a community, as a group for so long. Alaykum salam wa Here we need to begin to reach the perfection that we need to get to. And here we need to challenge a few thoughts. We need to break the thoughts that have kept us down, that have stopped us from the correct thought process. I want to ask again more simple questions. Imagine now, let us just pick London where I live as an example, and then maybe you can apply it to here, and we can begin to spread this thought process around the world. We have laws in London, we have laws here. Are you allowed to jump a red light in London and are you allowed to jump a red light here? You're not allowed? No? Okay. Why are you not allowed? 
What's the reasoning? What's the reason behind the, go the government, the law, putting in place that you cannot jump a red light in London, you cannot jump a red light here in Dar? What's the reasoning? Ahsan, discipline in traffic, safety for other drivers. Would you say that? If I jump a red light, the reason why I'm not allowed to jump the red light is because an oncoming car, where they are going green, what will happen? So I'm obliged to actually obey the law, aren't I? Now here I want to challenge this. No, no, I'm not saying challenge the red light. Don't jump the red light, huh? Let us think about this. When the Imam of our time comes, and he wants to make something legal and illegal, when he wants to make something within the Sharia ah and outside of the Sharia, ah, what words will he use? He will use the words that he uses within Quran. He will call something haram and he will call something halal. The Prophet, peace be upon him, when he used to designate something, when he wanted to say something was impermissible, he would use the word haram. Lying is haram. Stealing is haram. Now, if he was not confined to the Arabic language, what word would the Prophet have used? Legal and illegal. It is illegal for you to lie. It is illegal for you to steal. It is illegal for you to cheat. When the Imam of our time comes, he will have a law for what? He will have a law penal code system. Agreed? When the Imam of our time he comes, he will have an economic system. Agreed? When the Imam of our time comes, will he have a system for the traffic? He will, yes? Because the Imam has an all-encompassing system. Am I correct? The Imam has a system for everything within this universe. It is not mundane. There's a scholar by the name of Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Husseini Shirazi. May Allah bless his soul. Sayyid Shirazi was once writing in Qum. Sayyid Shirazi, if you know, has written 1400 books. 1400 books by the end of his life many of our community members will have met him in their lifetimes when he ended before he died his fingers you know they don't use he didn't use Microsoft Word like we use Microsoft Word he would write with pen after writing 1400 books his fingers were so bent that he could not even hold a pen properly Sayyid Shirazi was sitting and he was writing a book do you know what he was writing a book on he was writing a book on the etiquettes and the law of making food. You know, being in the kitchen, making food, like maybe we might do, or our wives, or our mothers, and our sisters, and the helpers in the house will do. He would write a book on the ethics and the laws of cooking. SubhanAllah. Someone in Qum came to him and said, Sayyidina, with respect, you are a grand madja. You are titled Imam Muhammad Husseini Shirazi. Don't you think you're wasting time writing books on the laws of cooking? Sayyidina Shirazi responded and said, Woe be upon you. Tell me, didn't Fatima to Zahra cook? Didn't Fatima cook? Yes, Fatima cooked. How can you say it's a waste of time talking about the ethics of cooking when Fatima cooked? The Imam, when he comes, he will not neglect anything. He will make a perfect law for everything. There is the law for cooking. There is even the law for traffic system. Now, I'm asking a very simple question. When the Imam comes and he writes an all-encompassing script for us to follow, if he goes to parliament and he rewrites the traffic laws and makes them perfect, will he use the word haram or will he use the word illegal? He will say it is illegal for you to jump the red light, won't he? He will say it's illegal for you to use the phone whilst you are driving. Why? Because it... It will put at risk other people's safety. I am saying to you, think about this very simply. At the time of the Prophet, he was confined to the words halal and haram because it was Arabic language. In our time, we are confined to the words legal and illegal. Really, they are the same thing. They are synonymous with each other. In my language, I will say it is haram to steal, but I will say it's illegal to do tax evasion. No, it is exactly the same thing. It is haram for you to steal, and it is haram for you to steal from the state. Does that make sense? They are synonymous with each other. The words are synonymous. Because the Prophet was confined to the word haram, he used the word haram. 
Wallah, if the Imam comes tomorrow, he will not say it is haram. He may use our language and say it's illegal for you to tax evade. It's illegal for you to jump the red light. It is illegal for you to use the phone whilst you are driving because you are putting people's lives at risk. It doesn't become illegal, it becomes haram. It is exactly synonymous. I need to raise my level of thinking. Instead of me thinking that there is one system for Sharia and another system for the rest of the world for me to tax evade and do dodge and to jump through loopholes, Instead of me thinking that I can cheat the state, but it's okay for me not to do it here, I should begin to really think about my system. I should begin to understand that these systems should be synonymous with each other. It is haram for you to not pay khums. It is also haram for you to do a dodge and tax evade. They're synonymous with each other. Instead of me thinking that I can do one haram within Sharia, ah, but it affects me not within the secular world, no, this is completely, completely incorrect. If the Imam comes, he will use the language of our time and he will say to you, it is haram for you to do tax evasion, for you to not pay your tax, for you to jump the red light, for you to use the phone whilst you are driving, for you to do something against the state, it is haram the same way it is illegal. There is no difference between the two. Our thought process is down here. We think it's okay to steal from government. Or we are told that it's okay to be able to take from a non-Muslim. Or we are told that because that this land has been stolen, that it's okay for me to go and steal back. We have lowered our way of thinking. We have regressed as human beings. Instead of thinking that what laws are good for society here is actually how Islam would also prescribe exactly the same law. If it is haram for me to tax evade, it is illegal for me to tax evade. If it is illegal for me to jump a red light, is it haram for me to jump a red light? Because the law is synonymous with each other. They are both seeking the ultimate good for what humanity's purpose is. We need to raise our way of thinking as to how the Imam will govern. When we govern ourselves like how the Imam will govern, that is when the Imam will come back and not a day sooner. The moment we continue to slip and slide into the shortfalls and the pitfalls of our own thought, we will regress and we will not be able to bring our Imam back towards us. Let us put it to us this way. Our ethic needs to be the sublime ethic. In everything that we do as the Shia, we need to be the ones who are the ultimate presentation of how the Imam wants us to be. There's a story of another Shirazi, of Sayyid Muhammad Ridha Shirazi. He passed away a couple of years ago. We've mentioned him from the pulpit before. One day it's narrated, Sayyid Ridha had a house next to the masjid. He lived in the house next to the masjid. Across from the masjid, there was a building. This was in the area of Kuwait City. In Kuwait City, this incident took place. There's a building, blocks being made. Some Egyptian workers had been brought over in order to make the building. As they were making this building, they were Sunnis. They were Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They come from Egypt to come and work as contractors, build and go back. One day, one of the people, one of the Shi'as from the local masjid was walking past and he noticed that during the break that these workers from Egypt were now praying like Shi'a. They used to be praying with their hands folded. All of a sudden, a few days later, when he noticed, he noticed that they were praying with their arms down. After they finished praying, he came over to them and said to them, forgive me. When I first saw you begin as contractors to build this very building, you were praying with your, hand, your arms folded. Hence, I could recognize that you were from the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Today, when I come again, I see that you are praying with your arms down. Why? What has changed in these few weeks? They said that there is an Imam from the masjid across the road. Every day, he used to come to us with a tray. On that tray were oranges and glasses of water for us. There were dates on that tray and some food that we can partake from. 
The heat was so much that he recognized that we were thirsty. He would go out and he would feed us these oranges and give us drink with his own hands. This person was the Imam of your masjid, Sayyid Muhammad Rida Shirazi. It was his ethic that turned us towards being Shia. We were inclined towards Shiism because we recognized that his ethic was so high. We wanted to follow the madhab of someone who represented this religion, not the religion we had been born into. This is the ethic that we are asking for. This is what you and I are obliged to perform in order to bring the Imam back. That it's not my tongue that brings a Sunni towards Shi'ism. It is my action that makes me worthy of being a Shi'a. When I see that there is that red light, when I see that there is any law that is a just law in my land, whether I live in the States, whether I live in London, whether I live in Canada, or whether I live in Tanzania, if it is a just law, I am obliged to follow it, whether it is a kafir government or another government. Why? Because it is dealing with the same ethic of the 12th Imam. His words, he may use the words haram 1400 years ago. Today he will say something is illegal. They are synonymous with each other. If I break the law today, I am actually performing a sin. If I perform a sin, I am the one who is accountable, whether it be a secular law or whether it be the law under the guidance of Sharia. They are one and the same. My ethic should be the ultimate ethic. And if I understand my ethic, then the Imam will come back that much quicker in front of my eyes. This is what we are trying to say. We have fallen short. When we talked the other day, Kuntum Khailun Ummatan Lin Nas, we said the Prophet's mind was up here. The Imam's mind is up here, his thought process is up here. We need to raise our thinking in order to be like that. Why is there ghaybah? The reason why there is ghaybah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing humanity. He is saying, can you not see what I have left you? Can you not see what treasures I want you to follow? Raise your thought process until you are capable of beholding that human savior. Because when he comes, he will expect you to think like him and he will not click his fingers and make you think like him. As we quoted the tradition from the fifth Imam three days ago. This Imam, this grand human being of ours, this outstanding Imam of ours needs to be understood. He needs to be understood better. It is not for us to stand and call Al-Ajal and think that we have done our role sufficiently. That is a poverty of thinking. You know where we need to get to? And again, we are challenging and breaking thought. We want to traverse the veils of this issue. Look at the difference as to where we are as a Muslim Ummah and where others are. Let us look at this again and finally come to a conclusion on where our thought process needs to be. Today, over these last 40, 50 years, we have seen the issue of Palestine. Our brothers in Palestine, the vast majority of them, are from the Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. And we call and fight on their behalf. When I say fight, I don't mean physically and literally fight, I mean struggle. We write, we speak out, we march, we demonstrate on their behalf. The illegal and illegitimate state of Israel, which is occupying the Palestinian land, goes against every charter in the United Nations. They are obliterating a society. The method of which is if we destroy the children, if we kill the youth, then the next generation cannot reproduce and then eventually we remove the entire Palestinian race. That is the objective. We as Muslims around the world demonstrate, march, read, write in order for justice to prevail over the occupied pan, uh, lands of Palestine. I pose a question to you again, brothers and sisters. Reflect deeply upon this question today and tonight. Answer it honestly. If it was the other way around, if it was the Palestinians that were occupying the land of Israel and were bludgeoning to death the Israelis, 
And they were using helicopter gunships to kill the Israelis. And they were using tanks to bulldoze over the house of the Israelis. Would the Muslim Ummah stand up on behalf of the Jews the same way the Christians today are standing up on behalf of the Palestinians? I want you to think deeply about this question. Change the incident. Imagine it was the Israelis, the Jewish brothers of ours that were being annihilated. How many of us would march on Al-Quds Day for the same thing? Answer it honestly. Be honest with me for a minute. Would you march? How many of us would march? I thought justice is justice irrespective of what color you are or what creed you are or what, how you look. The point I'm bringing is this. The Muslim, the poverty of thought amongst the Muslims today is that we are calling for an awaited savior and he is looking at us and he is saying, you will march on behalf of the Palestinians because they are Muslim, because the Israelis and the Jews are taking away the Palestinians' rights because they are Muslim. But if it was the other way around, you wouldn't go and lift a finger for the Jews. Why should I come when you haven't reached the perfect thought process? Why should I come when you're still not understanding justice as justice is supposed to be? If they were Hindu, how many of us here would go and march for them? If they were Sikh being obliterated, would I create a day every single year in order to march on behalf of the Sikhs? No. That, my friends, my respected brothers and sisters, is the difference between the Muslims and everyone else in the world today. Those Muslims march because they are Muslim to free Palestinian lands because they are Muslim. Those Christians have no religious association to Palestine. Those atheists have no religious association towards Palestine. Those Sikhs have no religious association towards Palestine. Yet they march in their hundreds and thousands around the world to free Palestine. That is the difference. They are doing it because it is good and just. We do it because we have a religious association. Who is higher? Who is higher? Tell me. The one who does it because they have an end goal or the one who is doing it because it is a pure deed. I am doing it lillahi azza wa jal. They are doing it lillahi azza wa jal. They are believing in their own God, be it Jehovah, be it God, be it Jesus. They are doing it for the sake of their God. Or they are doing it for no God at all. I am doing it because I want the Palestinian land. They are doing it because they recognize right is right. Who is higher? Who is better? Who is purer? This, this is why the Imam is not coming. This is why the Imam is not coming. Because we have a poverty of thought process. I am willing to steal from a non-Muslim because he is non-Muslim. I am willing to jump the red light because I don't term it haram. He's not watching. I will, I will, I will pay my khums because it's wajib, but I'll jump the red light because he's not watching. I won't march on behalf of a Hindu because he is Hindu. But the Hindu, I will expect him to march on my behalf. This is why the Imam is not coming. This is why we are still in the state in which we are today. The moment the Muslim Ummah the moment the Shia Ummah realizes this, the moment we as a human nation realize this, is the Friday he will come. When we say export Mahdiism, we are not talking about the name Mahdi. We are not talking about the 12th Imam. I am not talking about Bihar and Anwar. I am talking about the concept of right and wrong. The concept of justice as justice is supposed to be. The concept that humanity can reach that point. Why is the Imam in Ghaybah? What is the justice, the thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind removing this grand human being? The pinnacle of human thought? It's because he's waiting for us to reach the pinnacle of thought ourselves. Once his mind reaches our mind, that is when we will behold the victory of the Imam of our time. The master of the martyrs. The master of the martyrs was butchered to pieces. 
Hindus will come and they will represent on behalf of Abu Fadl Abbas, true? They will recognize Abu Fadl Abbas. Hindus and Christians, Mahatma Gandhi will come and speak about Abi Abdullah. I expect them to recognize Hussein, but I will not recognize them. Or worse still, I try to keep Hussein for me. Hussein is Hussein because Hussein is Hussein. If Imam Hussein salam, wasn't a Shia and wasn't a Muslim, but he was a Hindu and this exact same sacrifice took place, it would still be the greatest symbolism of right ever to have taken place. But we are honored that he is a Shia. We are honored that he is the son of Fatima. We are, we are honored that he is the grandfather of Mahdi. Hence, when he stands for justice, he was standing for justice for the whole of humanity. Whether you are a Hindu, whether you are a Christian, or whether you are a Jew, Hussein stands for justice, and that is what the Shia should be standing for as well. Hussein alayhi salam is universal. He penetrates like the sun penetrates and it comes to every part of this earth. This is where we need to reach to as a thought process. Imam was the one who stood for human justice. Twelfth Imam stands for human justice. The Shia will also stand for human justice. Imagine Sayyid Zainab. I want you to imagine a lady who is so strong physically that she can carry the body of Zain al Abidin alayhi salam out of a burning tent. And then I want you to imagine that by the time she reached back to Medina, her husband said, Are you my wife Zainab? Your back has become bent. Your hair has turned grey. Your face has become tired. Is this my wife Sayyida Zainab? Which Zainab am I seeing in front of me? When Zainab stood in front of the tyrant, when she was bound by her wrists, when there was a rope around her legs, when there was a rope around her neck, tying her from one child to another. Her rope was tied to her sister Kurthum. The other rope was tied to Sukaina, tied to Fatima to Sukhra, which tied to Zain al Abidin, which tied to young Muhammad Baqir. She stood in front of the enemy tyrant and said, I see nothing in this sacrifice except beauty. This is what I see from the sacrifice of Hussein ibn Ali. His sacrifice traverses every single human being that he is justice incarnate. Sayyidah Zainab is the one who stood in front of Yazid. It is narrated that one day within this confine, within that very darbar, once Yazid was looking and was asking, who are all these children? Name me one by one. It came to the daughter of Hussein ibn Ali, Sayyid Ruqayya. They pointed and said, this was Sakina. She is the daughter of Hussein ibn Ali. One man stood and said, Yazid, I want this young child. I want to buy this young child from you. What price will you put for her? I want to take her as a slave within my house. Sakina responded with such braveness. By Allah, you have lied. You can never take the daughter of Hussein. You cannot take the daughter of Hussein as a slave within your house. And we see that there is one tribulation that stands out above them all. I want you to remember that when Zain al Abidin was asked, O oh Zain al Abidin, what was the worst trial that you had to perform? Was it seeing the headless body of your father? Was it seeing that they trampled over his body and tore his chest to pieces? Was it that they slapped your sisters? Was it that they tore? 
the earrings from your sisters. As Zain al-Abideen says, Asham, Asham, Asham. Take yourselves to Sham. If you have been to Bazar al-Sham, take yourselves there at this point. Stand outside that gate, that great gate, and enter in with me. It is narrated by Zain al-Abideen himself. He says seven things happened to us when we entered the gates of Damascus that have not happened before. What seven things were they? The first thing was that we asked that they take the heads of our martyrs and place them at the front instead of placing them in between our women because if they see the heads of our martyrs between our women they will see our women without any chadar I want the heads to be at the front so they focus on the head of my father and not the head of my sisters the next thing was that they entered us through the biggest gate where so many people were they took us through the gate where the Christians and the Jews flocked they pelted us with stones and they said to us, this is the revenge for what happened in Badr, in Ahad, and in Hunayn. Then, as we entered, there were women who stood on the balconies of their shops. They took boiling water. They threw boiling water on us. I saw Sakina having boiling water thrown on her. That is why, that is why in the traditions we are told that when she is laid to rest, they couldn't eat even take the cloth off her because if they took the cloth it would have stuck to her body and ripped her skin from her young from her young body Zain al-Abideen says then they took us to an area whereby they tried to sell us off as slaves but the worst thing that happened to Zain al-Abideen was this that he narrates that as he entered into Sham there were women who took sticks of fire they took sticks and lit those sticks alight they threw them towards Zain al-Abideen Zain al-Abideen narrates that one stick of fire landed on my turf it began to burn my head but because my arms were chained I could not even stop the burning of my head Zainab had to come to me and take that fire off my turban Allah la'anat Allah ya lil qawmi al-dhalimeen wa sayya'lamu al-lazina zhanamu ayyumun qalabiyyan qalibun inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon Please raise your hands. Let us join each other in du'a. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior. Ya Allah. We ask you, Ya Allah, allow us to be alongside Him at all times in our life and in our death. Ya Allah, we are to pass away from this world before His coming. Raise us from our graves so that we may be alongside Him and participate in His victory. We ask you, Ya Allah, there are many people around the world who are going through such trials and tribulations. Ya Allah, we say to you on this Thursday night that we fear the day will come that just the way Jannatul Baqi has been bulldozed, we fear that one day Sayyidah Zainab will also be bulldozed. We fear that Sayyidah Raqayya will also be bulldozed. We ask you, Ya Allah, protect Syria from those who seek to destroy the goodness of Syria. We ask you, Ya Allah, grant the Syrian army victory over the terrorists and the rebels. We ask you, Ya Allah, for those people who are in need, especially in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Palestine. We ask you for those in Yemen and in Egypt. We ask you for those people who are going through trials and tribulations and those in Myanmar. Grant them victory, safety, security, education and medicine. We ask you, Ya Allah, forgive our sins, the sins of our parents, all those whom we love, all those that love us, all of our ulama, all of our leaders. We ask you, Ya Allah, allow us to perform the ziyarat of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all. Allow us to understand Quran better, the month of Ramadan better, Dua iftitah better, our fasting better. We ask you, Ya Allah, in the final moments of our life, as the shayateen encircle us and wish to quench our thirst by giving us water from their own wells, Allow Ahl al-Bayt to come to us and quench our thirst so that we may go into the next world in honor of Ahl al-Bayt. Ya Allah, allow us to die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Wa qatlan fi sabilika fa wafiq lana. Wassalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There are two announcements. The first one is a reminder that
tonight there is a youth program organized by the debate society for the ages of 16 to 40. The discussion is looking at how we can actively debate with our Sunni brothers and the methods of debate with our Sunni brothers. We also announced that next Wednesday, um, which is a day of holiday here, I understand it is Farmer's Day, National Farmer's Day. On the day of holiday on Wednesday, after the tafsir session here in the masjid, after Dhuhr, we are going to reduce the, the length of the tafsir session and we would like to keep an open question and answer session for the sessions that we have been giving. Meaning if there are any questions that have come and arisen from our discussions on our Tadabbur Fir Quran series, or on our series based upon the tafsir of the Aiftitah, if there are any questions, then we uh, openly invite them. Any criticism, feedback on Wednesday afternoon, inshallah, after the tafsir session, there will be an open session for us to discuss and to debate these issues. I ask you to recite one loud salawat in honor of the awaited Savior, Imam Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala, Faraj al Sharif. Oh